Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> wow, a very responsive audience. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to our ninth season of the Artisan Lectures. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. I would also like to express our appreciation to Thomas Donahue, who's done a very special uh, window display, and I uh, warmly recommend you look at it uh, after tonight's program. The General Society was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans, by the skilled craftsmen of New York City. These artisans represented so many different trades, as I just said, including carpenters, blacksmiths, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among other trades. Today, our 234-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free mechanics institute, our lot museum, and just for those of you who this may be your first visit, it is upstairs, and you're also welcome to have a look at the end of the program. Um, our General Society Library, of which, of course, you're in this evening. Um, you'll also find membership on the library on the front registration table. And finally, our nearly two-century-old lecture series, of which, of course, tonight's lecture is part of. To say a few words about our speaker this evening, I am delighted to introduce to you General Society member and artisan Jamie Swan. Jamie first spoke here two years ago on bicycle making, and it is he who suggested our speaker this evening, which was a fantastic suggestion. So thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Karen. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, I think this presentation is going to be very special. Um, it's certainly an understatement to say that our speaker tonight has a unique vocation. It got me thinking about what people do for a living, and it brought to mind an old TV commercial for Barney's, the men's clothing store. There's a group of little boys sitting on a stoop of a New York City tenement building. They take turns saying what they intend to be when they grow up. Humphrey is going to be an actor. Lewis, in a gravelly voice, says, I'm going to be a famous trumpet player. Fiorello looks forward to becoming the mayor of New York City. Casey has every intention of being in the World Series. The last kid is this nerdy little guy who's wearing an immaculate handmade suit. And they say in unison, what are you going to be when you grow up, Barney? <laughs> and he says, I don't know, but we're all going to need clothes. <laughs> Do you guys suppose that Jeff Wasson, when Jeff Wasson was a little kid, that he knew that he was destined to make clothing out of sheet metal? I met Jeff Wasson about 10 years ago. At that time, I was arranging activities for the Long Island Metal Worker Society. We used to have a meeting every month. It wasn't quite as nice, sorry. Once a month we would have a speaker come to our venue. It wasn't quite as nice as this room. And on the alternate months, we would visit some kind of industrial facility. So at that time, I was always sniffing around for shops to visit or interesting people to make presentations. Through the grapevine, I heard that there was some cat out there who was actually making a living by beating sheet metal into medieval armor. As you might imagine, I was intrigued. I tracked down Jeff Wasson, and he generously agreed to open his wonderful atelier to our motley crew. Mr. Wasson showed us the many stakes, hammers, anvils, and other special equipment that he uses in his trade. He gave us a thorough explanation, as well as demonstration, of some of the methods that he uses to craft the many components that fit together to become a suit of armor. It was fantastic to see his shop and his process. 
Today, I understand that Jeff has moved his operation to larger quarters. He has employees and apprentices, and a long queue of would-be knights waiting patiently for him to equip them to go into battle. I think the trade that Jeff Wasson has been drawn to pursue is fascinating because it goes far beyond metal craft. It is very much art. It involves scholarly uh, study of history, but hopefully these physical objects take us on a journey back in time through the looking glass of our own imagination. Yes, these fantastic garments are beautiful, but they are also implements of war. Even though all this may seem like science fiction, it is actually a window into the reality of our own not too distant past. And this is from the program. Jeff Wasson is an artist who specializes in making historical reproductions of medieval, medieval armor. He is considered to be one of the finest American armor makers working today, with a worldwide reputation for historical accuracy and attention to fine detail. Mr. Wasson is also a teacher and an educator who brings his love of history and craft to his presentations. He has worked on various projects for movies and television, but his main focus is making medieval armor, specializing in 14th, 15th, and 16th century European plate armor. Having also fought and jousted in the, in the armor he makes, Mr. Wasson is, has a unique perspective on its functionality. Also, as someone who is trained as an artist and sculptor, he is adept at particularly capturing the proper shapes to make authentic armor from an art form. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Lawson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. So uh, uh, to start, um, uh, everybody kind of always wants to know, like, how did, how did you ever get involved in this? Uh, making armor and wearing armor. And uh, it started when I was a child. And uh, you know, as a kid, you watch lots of movies or uh, read adventures. And I think it was Ivanhoe that uh, we saw on television, my brother and I. And uh, so that was one of those things that always intrigued me, knights in armor and uh, riding horses uh, as a knight in armor. So as a, as a kid, I always dreamed about doing that. And, uh, I was also very artistic. I always uh, made things. I, uh, my grandfather was an artist, so I had sort of a natural ability from him, and uh, I was always making things. And when I was in high school, I started uh, getting some scrap metal. I think it was an old car hood. And I started cutting it apart and hammering it into armor. And I thought in the beginning that, oh, this will be easy. I'll make, you know, make a cool uh, costume. Uh, but it's a lot harder and a lot more complicated than you would think. So, uh, so we'll start uh, there. So in high school, I started making armor, and um, when I got, I uh, after high school, I went to uh, college here in New York City at the School of Visual Arts, and it was in college that I ran into a group of people, medievalists, that uh, go out and fight in armor, and I thought, oh, this is so cool. I have to go do this. So uh, there you see some uh, pictures of this club. Uh, basically, they go out and hit each other with sticks, and they have battles, and uh, they have a good time. They have feasts, they dress up. Uh, you know, they're kind of like living out their fantasy of the Middle Ages and what it must be like, you know, to be in the Middle Ages. And, you know, it's a, it's a fun club to be in, but, you know, I was always striving for uh, more realistic or more, more historical sources of things. Um, all right, so uh, the other thing that I was very interested in when I was growing up was blacksmithing. Uh, and here you see uh, an image of uh, a forge and a bellows. That's a charcoal forge. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the things that I, I got interested in and I started doing is uh, blacksmithing. and. Um, and applying that, I guess what really interests me about the blacksmithing was that uh, it's like very elemental. Uh, you take uh, earth, water, air, and fire, and you know, there's almost like magical elemental forces that you're working with to create something. Uh, so there you can see a closer up of the fire. This is actually uh, a demonstration that I do at the Dalton School 
where I take my forge and my bellows and the anvil and I give a blacksmithing demonstration to the school kids there. Uh, I also do bronze casting. Uh, and it really is, uh, there is something really magical about it. You know, being able to take a piece of iron, heat it up red hot, it becomes like clay and you're able to form it and shape it uh, into something. Uh, and the other thing that you can do with metal is you can harden and temper it. So you're changing the very structure of it. Uh, on the right hand side you see the basic tools of the smith. So there's the anvil, there's um, the hammer, there are uh, tongs for holding the hot metal, uh, files, chisels, punches, a uh, bucket of water there. So if we're going to talk about armor, we need to talk about maybe the history of armor. And a lot of times people kind of just think of the Middle Ages kind of lumping everything together. But it really is a very long time period and can be considered, you know, 500 to 600 years long. And there's a lot of changes that happen. So this is kind of like the quick uh, uh, super... Uh, history of, of looking at it. So in the beginning, like at, at the year 1100, we have a guy there. That would be the time of like the Normans, William the Conqueror, and uh, he's wearing a coat of mail and he has a metal helmet. Uh, and you see as time goes by that the mail becomes longer, the helmet becomes more encompassing uh, until you get to the 14th century, the 1400s. Uh, then now you have a steel breastplate. You have limb defenses that are like gutter shaped plates for covering the arms and legs. Uh, the weapons are changing. Uh, when you get into the 15th century, 1450, now you have what everybody thinks of as like the full suit of knightly plate armor. Uh, and that would be called a harness. Uh, so, and then um, moving along more as you move further in time, 1525, uh, that's a Maximilian type of armor. That, that's what it's called when it has all these flutings in it. Uh, but that's also about the time that guns start to be used. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, changes in the military as far as like social, social changes. It's easier to pay soldiers uh, than to pay knights. Uh, plus you have uh, guns. So by 1610, now they're kind of like getting rid of armor because uh, in order to make the armor uh, bulletproof, which they were capable of doing, uh, the armor was becoming way too heavy to wear. So a lot of it was being discarded. So in 600 years, there's a lot of changes that happen and a lot of variation in fashion and, and function. But uh, I really like this graphic because I think it really illustrates, you know, the changes uh, that you see in a sort of simple, simple way. Uh, so these are some of the armors that I've actually made. Um, and when I started making armor, uh, I made it you know, I got involved in one of these uh, fighting clubs, so uh, we were um, fighting in it, and those people kind of want like a sport armor. They don't, you know, uh, it's funny how the rules of the game define uh, how, how things are played. Uh, so they didn't really want real armor, uh, but I was really interested in real plate armor, uh, and, uh, and as I got further along into it, uh, I realized that I couldn't do everything. Uh, so I decided that I would just focus on making plate armor and that it would be 14th century and 15th century plate armor that I would make. And then as time went on, I got dragged into making some 16th century armors as well. So uh, on the, um, the left-hand side is a, a, an armor from about the year 1400 or 1410. Uh, you can see it has very plain surfaces. Uh, the helmet is a bassinet with a aventail, which is covering, an aventail is the mail that's covering the neck. They still hadn't quite figured out how to protect the neck. Uh, in the 15th century, let's say 1450s, 1460, uh, that armor in the center there is uh, an Italian type of armor. It has uh, an armet. Notice that the neck is protected better. The, the uh, shoulders have uh, pauldrons, large plates that protect the shoulders. Uh, there's still mail protecting the armpits and the groin. Uh, but there's layers of plate armor there. Then you get into the 16th century, and now you have, uh, they've really figured out how to make those plates articulate and defend the neck. Uh, even the insides of the arms have articulated plates there. Although, probably people looking at this image would be like, well, how come his groin is like totally unprotected? <laughs> well, uh, 
The reason for that is most of the time, most knights would be riding on horses, on horseback. And so when you sit in the saddle, you have to have that area kind of free or cut away there. And, uh, and that's another thing is that you would, if you're wearing an armor like this and you're uh, sitting in the saddle riding, you, would, uh, you have a special saddle. And the saddle has a, what's called a saddle steel or pommel plates that protect your groin. Uh, so the saddle and the armor kind of have to go together. All right. So when I start out making an armor, I will do research. I read a lot of books. Uh, I look at a lot of pictures. I have collections of pictures. I go to museums uh, and look at armor. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has a wonderful collection of armor, and I highly recommend people check it out if you're really interested in armor. It's, it's really wonderful. Um, also, when I start making an armor, I will make a tracing. Uh, I'll have my patron come, the person that I'm making the armor for, and I will trace their body. Uh, and I will take circumference measurements. And using that information and also the references that I've collected, I'll start to draw in what the armor looks like. Uh, so from those measurements and uh, the circumferences that I've taken, I will start to make patterns. Uh, here are the patterns. Uh, and over the years, I've collected, you know, from making armor after armor after armor, I've organized my patterns, and I have like a library of patterns. So that way I can draw upon the knowledge that I've collected over the years. And I, rather than reinventing the wheel every time, I can just pull up the patterns that are, as, are, are similar to what I'm working on and use them as a basis to create something new. So here we have, sometimes it's, uh, it's easier to build, like start with a plate or a couple plates and then add onto it, right? Uh, so here is a, a sabaton, which is uh, like the shoe part of an armor. In fact, you can see the shoe in that, in that left-hand image there and uh, these, you know, talk about like a weird fashion, right? Those, those big, uh, having like a really wide foot like that. Anyway, uh, fashion, right? So, uh, so I started uh, with, a, with a couple of lames there on the foot, and then uh, I wasn't quite sure how to proceed, so uh, then I patterned the rest off of that. So sometimes I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll make patterns off of, off of existing pieces. Uh, so here you kind of see uh, the progression. So there's a pattern, and then it's cut out of metal, and then I start shaping it. And those are some pieces that are just in the first stage of being shaped. So one of, one of the projects that I got involved with in the past couple of years um, is the Art Institute of Chicago asked me to make a replica of a Greenwich armor. Uh, and uh, Greenwich is a, uh, a place in England, and it's where Henry VIII started a royal workshop. And uh, this armor, though, dates from Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's time, and uh, so the 1580s. Uh, so in this project, uh, the idea was to recreate the armor, but we were going to start by um, actually doing it from scratch, meaning like making the iron in the old way, all right? Because modern steel, steel mills, there's different processes, everything's very consistent, and, and usually the metal that I work with is, uh, uh, is, is consistent. You know, I call up and order a sheet, and it's all the same thickness all the way through, uh, and uh, medieval metal is not like that, all right? So to start, uh, you have to make the metal. So what you do is you put iron ore and charcoal in a furnace like this, and uh, you have a bellows hooked up to it, just like the one I showed you earlier, and uh, you run it for like 12 hours, and you pull out, you tear it open, and you pull out this spongy mass of metal, and uh, it's very inconsistent. So these guys are very carefully sort of like squeezing it with those mallets in order to kind of put it together, uh, and then from there, uh, what they're going to do is put it on the power hammer and start hammering it, forge welding it together. So in, at this stage, the metal is kind of like dough or clay, right? And if dough or clay is inconsistent, you have to mix it. And, you know, how the heck do you, do you mix something that's, you know, metal like that? It's, you know, how would you do it? Well, you do it by 
uh, forging it out, drawing it out so that it becomes thinner. And then what you do is you fold it over and then you weld it back together again and forge it back over again. That's what the Japanese smiths are doing when they're making their famous samurai swords. They're actually folding the metal. They're working with a, a poor uh, material that's not so good and they have to refine it in order to make it uh, uh, consistent enough that they can use it in their swords. So that's what's happening here. So here, uh, the guys, this is at Rick Fur's shop out in Wisconsin. He's the guy that made the metal for me for the Greenwich Project. Uh, here he is folding over the, um, the metal and then he'll go back onto his power hammer. Uh, now in the Middle Ages, they, uh, they actually had water-driven power hammers for the production of steel uh, that were, uh, so, you know, a lot of times people think like in the Middle Ages that, you know, it was just like one guy working like in the middle of the woods, you know, making swords and armor and stuff like that. Well, that's not really true. Uh, they were working in cities and towns and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a giant industrial manufacturing process with a lot of specialization. There were people that were making the metal, there were people that were making mail, there were people that were making plate armor, there were people that were just polishing the plate armor, there were people that were just making the hinges. So all different kinds of specializations going on. All right, so finally uh, I get my plate. Uh, they had to hammer the plate out. Most modern metal is made with a roller, and that makes the metal very consistent. Uh, so this plate was hammered out. In fact, uh, Rick was, you know, he was kind of, uh, it was difficult. It was not easy to hammer out a big plate like that. In fact, this is why you see in the early Middle Ages that everybody is wearing mail and not wearing breastplates, that breastplates don't appear until the 14th century. It's because they didn't have the industrial, most likely that they didn't have the industrial ability to produce enough steel to make full plate armor. Uh, but by the 14th century, it seems that they did. So once again, I start with a drawing uh, of the breastplate, and that's going to be my guide to shaping it. And I've started to draw in with chalk where I want to form it. Now, because this metal is kind of still kind of inconsistent, um, there we are, we're heating it up. And uh, this is a propane forge, uh, so it burns propane. I just stick the whole plate right on top of there, and I put uh, um, uh, bricks on top of it to kind of retain the heat. And uh, that's my assistant, Brad, at the time. So he's going to pull that plate out uh, with the tongs, because the plate weighs like 15, 20 pounds. And then I just start hammering. And I have a couple different types of hammers that I use uh, for doing this work. So there's one, you see it's got a very long uh, neck there to get inside. But we're still at a very, uh, at this point in the process, we're still uh, uh, just trying to draw it out and, and manage the plate. So uh, one of the things that happens is um, when you are hammering the metal, you are, uh, you're squeezing it against the hammer and the anvil. And uh, what happens is, so this actually creates volume. And this is how I think a lot of medieval armor was made, was made just by hammering on a flat anvil. Uh, and what happens is uh, the metal gets squeezed against the anvil and it squeezes out to the side, all right? And, and you, so you hammer it enough <clears throat> and then it will start to curl around and create volume. Uh, and if we move to this picture, now you can start to see there is volume being formed there. And this is a pretty thick plate, and I have to do it hot. Uh, there's no other way it could have been done. It, couldn't, it could not be done cold, because the, the inside of that plate is about a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, it would be way too thick to work. So after a lot of hammering, uh, this is kind of like a, a progression. Uh, it just so happens I had another Greenwich breastplate that I was working on at the same time, and so we kind of like lined everything up. Uh, the other thing too is that we were working on two different things. We were working on a Pizcod breastplate, but we were also working on a part called a placard, which is a secondary breastplate that goes over the first breastplate, and that's to make it bulletproof. All right, because in the 1580s, guns are really coming into being used, and armorers were looking for ways to, you know, make an armor bulletproof. So they would have this secondary breastplate that would go on over the top of it. So uh, here in this process, you can start to see, you know, get a sense of the shaping uh, and how it proceeds in stages. All right. So this, and when I made this breastplate, uh, it probably took me, 
I want to say like three or four weeks to go from a flat plate to a breastplate. And that wasn't me working around the clock. That was, you know, at a, at a slower sort of pace. Uh, one of the things that was happening was Nova was making a documentary at this time. So I was kind of held in check by, oh, you got to wait until we can get there to film, Jeff. So can you only take it to this far? But we want to show as much as we can in the, in the amount of time. So, you know, a bit of a headache there. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was good, kept me on track. Uh, so a lot of times I'll use um, a template. And once again, it comes from the drawings. Uh, to, to also keep me on track and make sure that I'm getting the right shape. I'm making sure that it's deep enough, uh, so I'll sort of divide the armor into sections. Uh, in the background there, you see that uh, there's a special caliper there, and that's for measuring the thickness. So after a lot of hammering and heating, uh, you start to end up with something that looks like armor. Uh, so this is the piece called breastplate, and now you can see the edges have been uh, rolled or hemmed. Uh, they've been roped. Uh, the embossing has been put in. The embossing is, uh, so on 16th century armors that have etching and gilding, uh, what they'll do is uh, the, the metal will be sort of stepped down or recessed, so that way the, the etching can't be worn off, uh, so they can polish the raised areas. So I think you can see one of those, a couple of those lines in the, uh, in the back plate and then also in the breast plate. So uh, also the thing, one of the things that needs to be made at this point in time are the uh, hinges and hardware that hold the breast plate together. So this is a, uh, a hasp or hasp hinge that's going to hold the breast plate to the back plate. And, uh, you can see in the material there how it kind of almost looks like, uh, I don't know, like cookie dough or something. You see all the cracks in it and uh, the inconsistencies. So, uh, you know, that's, that's this old bloomery uh, type steel. That's what, uh, what it does, the qualities that it has. And, you know, when you go to the museum and you look at armor, you'll see there's a lot of irregularities in the metal there. And I've always wondered if it was just because those pieces are so old that maybe they've become rusty and then they've been re-cleaned, or is it because of the old metal? And I think, I think it's a little bit of both. <clears throat> so in order to make a hinge, you take a, a piece of a sheet of metal and you fold it over and uh, around a mandrel, and then you take and cut out the slots. Uh, and I'll use a little chisel to knock those out. And then I will take a file and file the edges, and I'll, I'll have to, uh, you know, manually, I don't, I don't use any machines or anything like that. It's all done by hand and eye to, uh, to make sure that it all fits very nicely. Uh, and then you get a hinge like that. Uh, this is a hinge that's, that's actually integral to the piece, meaning that the two plates that, that curl around uh, the hinge comes right off of those plates. So right now I've just got a nail stuck in it to make sure that it fits and works. So, uh, and up above there, there's a hem you can see uh, at the top. And uh, if we go to the next slide there, uh, this is part of a, a gorget, which is uh, a neck defense, okay? And each of those lames, like right now, uh, in the process of putting it together, it's just nut and bolted together. Uh, and I, I use nuts and bolts just to hold the plates together while I'm working them and to make sure that they all fit properly. Uh, and, uh, but gradually, I'll keep adding pieces. So you hammer and work a piece and you fit it to the next one. And one by one, after you know, 200 pieces, plates later, then you have an armor. However, it's not done yet. Uh, so right now, this armor, uh, this is a German early 16th century armor, and uh, we're at the fitting stage. So the, uh, the patron has come back and uh, has tried the armor on, and actually I put him in a saddle there to make sure that he's comfortable, that the armor fits and works well, and that he can hold his lance, and that he can see out of the visor in the right way. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that all the parts are nut and bolted together. I think, the, I, think I had finished the gauntlets at that point. Once I'm sure that everything uh, fits and uh, is working properly and it fits the, the uh, patron really well, 
then uh, I go to the heat treating, okay? So uh, most of the time I'm using steels that uh, can be hardened and tempered, okay? That means that they have enough carbon in them to, uh, to take to a heat treatment. And uh, so I have a, uh, a pottery kiln that I use as a furnace. And uh, what you have to do is, is uh, because the metal wants to warp, you have to build these structures that, that hold it in place. And also, you know, you can't just reach in there and pick up, pick out something that, that uh, is 1,500 degrees. You have, to, you have to very carefully grab it. So I have a hook and I have wires. So that way I can like reach in there, grab it out, and then I quench it. I quench it in oil. And uh, as you can see there, the oil just flames up. And that's why I have all that safety equipment on to make sure I don't get burned. Uh, the flames go out really quick though. Uh, they're, they're smothered uh, as soon as the thing cools down. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, that's the Greenwich breastplate and backplate after they've been uh, hardened. And you can see the bracing I have on there to make sure that they don't uh, warp. Because when something like steel like that is under such sort of stress like that, uh, it's under so many stresses that it can, it can warp or move. Uh, and, and, and then it wouldn't fit properly. Uh, so that's why we have those braces on there. And it looks all black like that because of the burnt oil. So it really, it really looks pretty awful. Uh, so then the next step is to uh, take it apart and we go to grinding, sanding, and polishing. Uh, so everything has to be taken apart. All those nuts and bolts come out. And I have different sanding belts uh, that I use to sand. And uh, over the years, I've come up with a pretty good um, process for doing sanding and polishing. Uh, I think I have about five or six steps that I use uh, for the sanding and polishing. And I have it set up in a way that I can just go from one to the next you know, without having to change my wheels, right? I, I remember when I first started, I had like one machine and every, anytime I had to like, uh, you know, go from one step to another, I had to change everything out. It was really, uh, it was difficult. So this is very nice because I can just move from one thing to the next. So, uh, and sanding and polishing, uh, you know, if you want to talk about how long it takes to make an armor is probably, can easily be like one third of the process is just sanding and polishing, grinding, sanding, and polishing the metal. And that also depends upon, you know, the complexity of it. So we're kind of skip, skipped ahead here. Uh, uh, so this is the Greenwich breastplate. So after it was polished, it was then sent out to uh, Chicago uh, where there was an artist that etched it. All right, so they made designs, painted designs onto the metal. And then uh, they used an acid. Actually, it wasn't an acid. It was a corrosive salt uh, to corrode away the metal and create the etched design, all right? Uh, and then from there, it got sent to Germany. And there was a gentleman in Germany that did the gold plating uh, and, uh, or the gilding, I should say. And he actually did it the real uh, original way that these things were, were gilt, and that is with mercury gilding, all right? So, which is very dangerous and, and uh, bad. You really have to have the right equipment. Uh, I didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, actually, I think they had trouble trying to find a place to do it here in the States because you really have to have, like, the proper venting. It's really an, a giant environmental hazard. And uh, I think that that term, you know, like mad as a hatter, comes from when hatters used to use mercury to, uh, you know, fume mercury off their hats or whatever. So anyway, yeah, you have to have, what you do uh, with mercury gilding is you're mixing the mercury with gold and you're creating this paste that gets painted onto the design. And then you have to heat it up so that the mercury uh, evaporates away and it deposits the gold onto the metal. So, uh, so that's how it's done, and uh, so once again, you really have to have the right equipment to do that. So then it came back to me, and uh, the final step was for me to blue it, all right? And the bluing uh, happens with heat. So once again, I turned the kiln on. I wasn't up in the 1500 degree range. I was, I was in the lower range, like 650 degrees. Uh, and uh, you get these, if you have a piece of polished metal, and you heat it up to that range, you start to get these wonderful colors. They're, they're oftentimes called tempering colors because they happen at the, uh, at the color 
you know, this is how old smiths used to make sure that they were tempering their knives or tools just the right way. You get a straw color, and then a red color, and then that turns into a purple, and then a blue, and then like a steel blue, uh, and then you're out of the range. But so you really get this, and the photographs don't do it justice. It's really incredible iridescent color, and it's just a very thin film of oxidation that's on the metal. So uh, once the parts are, uh, all the decoration has been done, now they can be assembled. So uh, at this stage, uh, I'm taking rivets and I'm riveting pieces of leather. Uh, there are lining straps that the linings are sewn to and there are also uh, straps that hold the plates together. So this is the gorget and it has these leathers here that are uh, holding it together and allow it to be flexible so that the person can move their neck. Uh, and if we move again, there it is all assembled. And there's the breastplate and the gorget on Jonathan Tavares from the Art Institute of Chicago. So uh, Jonathan really... <laughs> Uh, Jonathan is really into doing everything proper, so as well as having this armor made, he wants to show everything in context, and so he also had the clothes made up that you would wear underneath it, the doublet and, and the, uh, uh, the collar and, and all of that. So there's still a couple more parts that I'm working on that need to, uh, to fill this out, but uh, certainly it's very impressive, and you can see how you know, if you think about the time of Elizabeth and you think about, you know, the 1580s and there's wonderful portraits of these noblemen and how they have all these incredibly beautiful fabrics that they wear in their doublets and their, and their costume and how a breastplate and armor like this is mimicking that, right? And uh, with all the colors and the designs uh, that go into it. So, so armor is really uh, as much about being a functional thing, about keeping people from, from being killed and uh, keeping them protected is also about fashion and status. So they're really, sh and, and even though this is like etched and gilt and blued, uh, it's, also, uh, it's also fully functional, all right? This armor would protect somebody from swords, arrows, uh, even bullets. All right, this, this is the breastplate that I, I did for the Art Institute and uh, it had a uh, placard plate that went over the top of it and they actually fired a gun at it to see if it would resist and it did. So if you, if you wanna check it out, you should check out the Nova documentary and it has a lot more information about the process and about, uh, about the, uh, the test with the gun. So, uh, so back to sort of making armor. So, uh, Here's the inside of a, of a helmet, and uh, it is lined with linen that's stuffed with cotton or wool. And uh, these linings are stitched into the helmet. Uh, and this is a, an armament, and uh, it has hinges, hinged cheek, cheek plates that allow it to open up. And this allows you to get your head into it because it does, it's very close fitting, all right? Uh, and the other thing you'll notice is down around the neck, there's kind of a flange there, and that flange grabs onto the collar of the uh, gorget in order to uh, create a turning joint. So actually, it's, it's very round, and it allows the wearer to move their head back and forth so that they can actually turn their head. Uh, and the genius of this, uh, and, and of this armor and of this uh, style is even though, like you'd think that'd be a weak point, you know, having a hinged plates in the front there with them opening right in the front. Well, the visor comes down and locks the whole thing in place. So when you have the visor down, there's no way that those hinged cheek plates could pop open. All right. So uh, here's, um, this is a great image, probably the best image that we have of an armorer's workshop. Uh, and it really shows a lot. And I also have an image of me working in my shop there, just so we can sort of compare things. Uh, so in the, in the image on the left, we have the Emperor Maximilian, and he's in his workshop. Uh, it's, he's not, it's, it's his royal workshop, right? See, so at, at this point in time, the uh, royalty of, uh, of Europe like to have their own special workshops with armors that were making armor, you know, for their own personal use and for their friends and to give away as gifts. 
So he's in the shop there checking out, seeing what the armorers are up to. Uh, you see in the background, in the upper right-hand side, you see a forge with bellows. Uh, there's an anvil uh, there. It's a big square anvil. At this point in time, the anvils didn't have horns on them unless it was like for some specialty type of use. On the left-hand side, in the middle, you have a shear uh, poking out of a stump. That's for cutting plates, uh, cutting steel. All the way in the back against the wall, you have uh, armor that looks like it's done that's hanging on the wall. And underneath there, there's a bench. You have uh, some plates there. You have what, what look to be like plates that are, are, are just cut out and flat and they're just sitting there ready to be shaped. Uh, so coming back to the foreground, you have the bench where the armorers are working. And it's very interesting because they're all doing different things. One guy is hammering what's called a lame, right, which is a, a kind of like what you saw in the, uh, in the neck defense that I showed you, like just a simple rectangular plate that's curved to the shape of the neck. He's hammering uh, on a lame there, uh, working from the inside of the metal. Uh, the guy to his right is hammering on the outside, and he's putting crests, what look to be crests, into a, what's probably a quise, which is a thigh defense. Uh, also, you see that their table is like littered with tools. Uh, I, I can say that's very accurate. My, uh, my shop, oftentimes the tables just get covered in tools and, you, and then you can't find anything and you're like, uh, okay, it's time to clean up. So, uh, and a lot of those tools we can recognize. There looks to be some files, some chisels, hammers. Uh, yeah. So uh, looking at my shop, uh, you see me working on my anvil, and I have a giant round ball stake. And what I'm doing there is I'm, I'm raising the metal, and I'm raising it hot. You can see it's glowing. My forge is uh, on the left-hand side there. It's a uh, propane forge. It's kind of tiny. Uh, I also use oxyacetylene tanks, which are in the background there. Um, and uh, to the right is like the table, one of the tables, a workbench with all the hammers and stakes. So, uh, you know, I talked about shaping the metal and uh, like with the Greenwich breastplate, I was shaping it from the inside. Uh, on a lot of stuff that I do, I also shape from the outside. Uh, I've, over the years, and let's see, I've been making armor, let's see, since high school, maybe over 25 years I've been making armor, uh, and I've, I've tried to learn as many different techniques as I could from all different people, uh, and I'm still trying out different ideas and uh, playing with those ideas that work for me. Uh, so especially using modern metal and also, you know, having a time frame where I have to build something. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll weld things together in a modern way, uh, and then I'll for like I'll weld up a cone and then I'll forge that down into a shape. So I'll create a volume, uh, you know. Uh, so I use a lot of techniques that are maybe more modern, but the finished result that I'm shooting for is something that's that's medieval, uh, or at least looks medieval, you know, uh, from the outside. So here's another view of my shop uh, with the with the table on the left. There's a leg vise there. Uh, you can't really see it. It's kind of hard to make out. Let's see. There is, is there a pointer here. Yes. See this uh, this um, lever right here with this. This is a shear. Uh, it's called a Beverly shear, and it's what I use to cut the metal. So right here, I have my stack of metal. It's all sort of organized within a different cardboard. Uh, I take out the sheets, trace on them, cut them out. Then it comes over to something like this where it'll be shaped. This is a, a dishing stump. Uh, I could also work uh, on the anvil. So uh, the anvil has a hardy hole right here, which is a place to put different tools, hardy tools. And I have, you don't see it in this picture, but just to the left here, there's a bunch of tools that can go in there. Uh, I also have a table back here with tools, a uh, welder. There's the forge. Um, so there's all kinds of stakes and tools down on the floor here. A lot of the tools I've, I've made over the years to try and make the process of armoring go faster or, uh, and a lot of times what ends up happening is that they are, they work, uh, they don't always work out the way you think they are. 
Uh, so sometimes I've made some things and it's just like, no, this is not going to work. Uh, but you keep it laying around and then later on you find a use for it. Uh, so one of the things that I do now is uh, I'm really interested in passing on what I know of how to make armor. So, uh, and I have this space in Queens now, and so I'm, I'm trying to teach classes, uh, run workshops out of my workspace, uh, and share my knowledge with people so that other people can learn how to do this. Uh, so one of the classes I did, this is, these are helmets that a class uh, made last, uh, about a year ago actually, back in February. Uh, Viking helmets and uh, okay they're not quite Viking because this is the Coppergate helmet which was found in York and it was kind of a little bit before the Viking Age but you know you get the idea so uh, they took uh, flat sheet steel they hammered it to shape and they riveted the, riveted the pieces together uh, to make their own helmet and everybody went home with a helmet so I'm uh, trying to do more of these types of things uh, and uh, yeah, share my knowledge. I, I also teach at the School of Visual Arts in the sculpture department. I teach a cutting and welding uh, metalworking class. Uh, so students learn how to do cutting and welding for sculpture. Uh, and uh, I'm looking to bring more of that. I feel that the design of armor and the techniques that I've collected and learned how to use over the years and also the design uh, uh, you know, how, how medieval craftsmen and how armorers approached metalworking and design, there's a lot to learn there and there's a lot to bring into modern metalworking. There's a certain like minimalism to the armor uh, that I think people, modern people could appreciate. So here's some pieces that I've made. Uh, on the left is an Italian armor. Uh, and on the right-hand side is an English armor, and they are, are actually very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, the type of helmet is, is different. The English armor has a great, a great bassinet, which uh, buckles down front and back, so it really holds your head in place. It's almost like a, uh, almost like a neck brace, uh, but it's very safe. Uh, although this style of helmet didn't last... Uh, it lasted a long time, but that was because it was very useful in tournaments. But, but knights didn't like to wear these in war or a battlefield situation because they were too restrictive. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that uh, I'd rather be able to take, you know, take my helmet off and on uh, you know, if I'm in a war situation uh, you know, because it's much more comfortable than be stuck in this like, thing that's like a neck brace. Also, you can't hear so well. So, uh, because the, the face opening of the helmet is very narrow, right? I mean, it's very protective. And that's another thing with armor. It, it really is a balance between how much, how well do you want to be protected and, and how well do you want to move, you know, mobility and protection. Uh, so, some other things like the, the English armor has a lot of flutes on it in the gauntlets and uh, on the uh, shoulder defenses. Um, the English preferred these long skirts. Okay, you can see the skirt, which is called a fald, is much longer, and the tassets, which are the plates that, that cover the uh, junction between the legs and the skirt, uh, there's no opening there for, for riding a horse, right? Everybody notice that? So on the right-hand side, the Italians preferred mounted combat, and so they have, uh, you know, they have that cut out there, and they have a much shorter skirt. All right, uh, going back to the English armor. Uh, so in my research, I, I look at a lot of images. Uh, we really don't know, uh, a lot of armor doesn't survive. Uh, we have very few pieces, you know, the further back in time you go. And in, in fact, hardly anything. Uh, it's unbelievable. It just, you know, people recycle. Uh, you know, the metal has been, uh, reformed into other things, cut up and made into other stuff. Uh, sometimes I know when I've gone to museums, I've seen, uh, you know, you could, you could see pieces of decoration, things that were definitely armor that have been turned into hinges and other, other stuff. So, uh, so yeah, it gets recycled. So the, the way that we know how these styles of armor uh, look like uh, has, has to do with looking at artwork, all right? And, um, uh, Somebody just recently uh, published a, a wonderful book 
uh, it's on English Armor. His name is Toby Capwell, and uh, he's a curator at the Wallace Collection in London. And uh, I, I'm a friend of his. I've actually made Toby armor uh, that he's jousted in because he's really into, with, into this in the same way that I am. And uh, he just he went the direction of becoming a museum curator. And uh, anyway, so he wrote this book, and I, uh, being his friend, and he knew that I was an artist, he had me do some of the illustrations in the book. So, uh, so I had, uh, you know, I, I had access to his research, and it really helped greatly in this armor that I made, this English armor. Uh, so, and you could see the statue, the funeral effigy, uh, on, on the uh, left-hand side there, and on the right-hand side is my uh, copy of it. So, and the way that that's done is with embossing. So you take a piece of brass and you use tiny little chisels, they're blunted, and you uh, hammer them out. And I was just doing this right into a stump. I think if you're doing it properly, you would work into pitch. Uh, and then it gets wrapped around and riveted to the helmet. So this is a 16th century armor, probably one of the most complicated armors I've worked on. On the left-hand side is the armor that I made, and on the right-hand side is what I copied. So uh, this armor is German, and uh, it, it dates from about 1525. Um, and uh, so the, the real one is actually gilt uh, and etched in certain areas. Uh, it has these wonderful spade uh, motifs. And, um, and I tried to capture some of that in the, in the armor that I recreated. I think you can see the, uh, uh, see the similarities. Uh, the, one, uh, the original one is actually missing the leg harness and missing the gauntlets. So we actually had to do some research to track down what, what the gauntlets and the leg harness would look like. Uh, so here's another view of it. Uh, and you can see that by the 16th century, they're really getting technically good at um, engineering the plates so they cover the body really well. So the neck is completely protected. Uh, there's, a, there's a turner there so that he can turn his, uh, his head different directions, uh, rotate his neck back and forth, and his neck is completely covered by plate armor. Uh, the insides of the arms are also protected by collapsing plates. Uh, the uh, pauldrons, which are the defenses for the shoulders, completely cover, wrap around the body. And they're, held, they're no longer held by straps and buckles. They're actually held by little pins uh, that allow them to go on. So everything is, is, uh, is uh, very well engineered. Even the edges of the plates, there's decoration. If you look at the skirt there, you can see uh, punch and file work, and the edges are beveled. Uh, also, at this time in the 16th century, they're roping all the edges. Uh, you know, you can see the roped edge. So it's really this incredible synthesis of engineering, design, art, uh, you know, function. Because uh, this armor, it, it was meant to be worn. It was meant to be worn and used in battle uh, to fight with. Uh, now there's still, you know, we still have like an opening down at the groin so you can ride a horse. Uh, and also on the right-hand side, the pauldron there, there's that little gap. And what that's for is so that he can hold a lance. Uh, and those two little holes right there are for a lance rest. I think when, when I, uh, this was actually when um, I, uh, I was working, he, this gentleman actually wanted to go to an event in this armor, so I was working right up to the deadline to get it done. I remember uh, my apprentice and I were just working like mad people, you know, right up to, to get it finished. Uh, you know, stitching things together, whatever. And then I hopped in the car, we threw it in the car, and I drove up to deliver it to him. And then he got into the armor, and we took a bunch of pictures. But at this point, I still hadn't had the lance rest done. So later, I got that done. Uh, this, this gentleman, uh, as well as he fights on foot, and he's also going to uh, eventually joust in this armor. So uh, here's a, a type of helmet called a Morian. And this is the type of helmet that probably everybody thinks of, like the Spanish conquistador is wearing. Uh, and this uh, type of helmet was, it was actually a style that was used by many different nationalities all, all across Europe uh, in the 16th century. 
Uh, this, this Morian is decorated, it's etched and gilt and blued. Actually, I did all of the etching and gilding. I, I did not do mercury gilding. I used uh, uh, the size with gold leaf to gild it. So uh, I didn't want to die. Um, I didn't want to go crazy either. Uh, so, and then those little lion heads, which, are, um, which you see on this style of helmet quite a bit, uh, I made up a little model and had somebody cast those uh, and, and then, and then gold-plated them. So, uh, and you can see the helmet is lined. So some other things, uh, there's one of those uh, hinge hasps that you saw earlier that was uh, up on the upper left there. Uh, that's used to hold the, the breastplate to the backplate on the Greenwich armor. And uh, in the right-hand corner, so like uh, that's one of the things that, as an armor, uh, in the past there would have been separate guilds or specializations to to make these other parts, like like buckles and hinges and straps. I have to do myself, so uh, I do a lot of that as well. Uh, on this, in the right-hand corner, is a um, is a stamping tool, like a top and bottom die for making a washer like a decorative washer, and it's stamped out of brass. So the way that tool is made is it's, it's kind of like forged and carved the male part uh, and then stamped into a hot piece of steel to get the negative. And then the, uh, you know, once that's cooled down, then I can use these top and bottom dies to stamp out the different uh, forms that I need. So as well as making armor, uh, I also do uh, television and movie work. Uh, some of the armor kind of translates to what I do, or the blacksmithing translates to uh, the stuff. Uh, you know, they always, it's funny, the, the Hollywood people, they always want, uh, oh, can you make it blacksmithed? And they always want it like, to look rough and, uh, and hammered. And, but really, the reality is, is you know, if you have a proper anvil and the right tools, you can get very smooth surfaces, you know. In fact, when I have done work for them, I've had to, we had to find a special anvil that was already all roughed up and rough so that it would make, make the pieces look rough enough for these people. Uh, but anyway, a couple of things here. Uh, for one, one movie, uh, Men in Black, we made these, uh, these, it was supposed to be some sort of like prison restraint. So that was made out of eighth inch thick aluminum and it was TIG welded together and made to look all rough. And uh, we actually had to make two or three of these things, I think. And uh, it's really unbelievable. You know, they, they want, they make these props and uh, uh, the props see like 30 seconds of time and that's it, you know, for something that took two, three weeks to make, you know. Of course, I'm always like, I, I want to see it. I've gotten over that, you know, that I'll, I just won't end up seeing it because I know it's only going to be there for a couple of seconds, I, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the second thing on the right-hand side, also made out of aluminum and also uses the skills I've acquired over the years for making hinges and joining pieces and putting things together. So I, I found that the, because I make armor from scratch, uh, from, you know, starting with my, making my own patterns and designing myself and trying to reproduce stuff, it, it has really uh, made me a really good problem solver and decision maker and having to have a good artistic eye. In fact, uh, I never thought about it at the time, but when I was in art school, they make you take anatomy class, and that really came in handy, you know, because understanding anatomy, if you understand the skeleton and anatomy, then you can understand how, you know, mechanically things can fit and work over the top of that body. And uh, so back in the beginning, you know, I said I was part of a medieval club and, uh, uh, you know, we, we did that. I, I still occasionally go out and fight with those guys for fun, but I'm, I'm getting kind of old, too old for that. Uh, uh, anyway, but the horse is a great equalizer. So, uh, and that's really uh, my love now is uh, horseback riding and jousting. And actually, my wife and I have both been jousting for about 15 or 16 years now. So, in fact, uh, so the, our last trip, we went to Australia uh, to joust. 
there's actually a circuit of people, international jousters, and they kind of know each other through Facebook. And we, uh, you know, travel to different tournaments and meet each other, and different people host each other. And uh, it's a wonderful way to, you know, travel and meet new people and uh, have somebody that knows the country and then, you know, joust in a tournament with them and exchange ideas. So, uh, so for jousting, the type of jousting that we do is balsa jousting. So that means that there's a piece of balsa at the end of the lance that breaks. But that's still, you know, there's still a lot that can go wrong. Uh, you know, it's not 100% safe, we try and make it safe, and we're wearing, you know, the idea is that we're wearing full plate armor to be totally protected, and, uh, and the target area is the shield. We wear these shields, uh, and that's where we're trying to hit each other, and uh, we are putting on a show, but it's also very competitive. So, uh, like a lot of these balsa tournaments, you know, they're serious about, about doing really well and hitting the target every time. Uh, all right. Yep, that was from Australia, and I'm wearing uh, my 14th century armor. Uh, so uh, that's, that's another thing. I'll just go back one. When, when you start wearing full armor, uh, and your face is completely covered, and everybody's maybe wearing a sort of similar style, you can't tell who's who. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's where heraldry comes into play, right? So that's why, you know, on a shield, you would have these bright colors. And uh, it, you know, it's a display that lets other people know from far away that that's who you are, that that's, you know, Sir So-and-so. Uh, and, uh, and that also shows up on the surcoat and can be in the feathers, right? Like we, uh, uh, as you see in that picture, that's actually my wife on the right-hand side with the, uh, the red shield and, and me on the left-hand side with the green feathers in my helmet. So you have these crests and you have this heraldic display that shows off who you are. And, you know, this really becomes important both, well, in a tournament, so you know who's who, but also on the battlefield, right? So, and also banners. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of like in modern times, you know, companies have logos so that when you're driving down the highway, you can easily tell what, what gas station that is or you know, what store that is just by the logo and the design, right? It was, this is a form of early graphic design. All right, so there I am again. Even my horse has, gets its own, what's called a comparison, which is uh, uh, you know, the colors. All right, so that uh, pretty much wraps things up. Uh, if you wanted to find out more, there's my website, Watson Artistry. Uh, you can check out the Nova documentary, Secrets of the Shining Knight. Uh, on YouTube, uh, a couple years ago, I did something called Dressing in Steel, where I, uh, I did a little demonstration on stage there and also dressed in my armor. And uh, yeah, please check out my website if you're interested in taking uh, classes. And I'll try and be better about posting things. All right, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. There we are. Hi, you have the jousting group, but do you have also the uh, people that make armor? I mean, how many people are like you? Oh yeah, uh, there is uh, there is a community of armors, people that are making armor, and uh, but they're I think a lot of them are like a lot of people that participate in the groups that just fight on foot. A lot of them are do-it-yourselfers, so they want it, they make their own and they work out of their garage or wherever. Or there's a workshop. Uh, Something that's difficult to make is the helmet or the gauntlets for the hands, so you have more professional people doing those parts or breastplates. Uh, so the more complicated armor is made by people that are more, that are real armorers. 
But, uh, and these people are scattered all over the place that are doing this. I, I really don't know. I've never taken like a poll to find out. I know there, there are a lot of armors out there and a lot of people try and do this, but I think it's uh, too intense to make a living at. So they don't, they might not necessarily have the right skills to make it work as a business, you know, to be able to deliver something and to, uh, manage their money well enough uh, to run, it's, it's hard because there's, it's a lot of hard work uh, to make a full armor. So as far as people like at my level, I know that there's maybe five or six or seven people here in the United States that I could name that are, that are maybe up at my level. Uh, and then under that, you know, then it starts to fan out. So there's probably like 20 people and then, you know, hundreds of, um, uh, people working out of their garages or whatever, maybe a thousand, I don't know. So, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, Mr. Wesson, um, just curious, over here. <laughs> How much um, weight of full body armor weight? Uh, uh, my armor weighs about uh, 60 to 65 pounds. And that's, that's probably about the weight that most armors from the Middle Ages would weigh, but you know, if you're a large person, you're gonna have more metal and it's gonna weigh more. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe you want a more protective armor. So maybe you're wearing an armor that is made of thicker plates so it could weigh more. But there is a limit to what uh, a man or person can, can wear as body armor and still be able to walk around and fight. And, and I, I really think it does fall around 60, 65 pounds. If you look at sort of what soldiers are required to carry, you know, for the, for the past uh, 600 years, you'll see that it's, you know, it's in that area. I think, though, recently somebody was telling me that, like, they require guys to carry 80 pounds in the military these days to somebody, and I thought that was sort of ludicrous. Uh, but, but, yeah, there's a limit to what, and I would say it's around 60, 65 pounds is probably a good average for what a, like, a, a war armor would, wear, would weigh in the Middle Ages. Okay, next question. Um, could you just go back to this previous slide? I had my phone off. I would like to take a picture of those. Sure. Yeah. Thank uh, you. And this then, one right here? And then back to your smiling face after that. Sure, yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture, first of all. Um, I have a multi-question kind of a question, but I, I'll sum it up with this. Do you struggle between the historical accuracy of the armor and your own interpretation of what's like aesthetic and what's actually going to work ergonomically? And then therefore, does that translate into like a signature, almost like a designer? The answer, <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think when I first got started, I, you know, I was maybe a little bit more creative with what I was doing, but as I got more and more into it, I started realizing that these guys really knew what they were doing and I should try and replicate exactly what it was. Uh, and now my thinking is really like that, like it's so rigid. So sometimes when I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I like to just take a piece of steel and hammer on it and don't have any preconceived ideas about what I'm doing and just do something weird. So. In fact, I think that maybe might be the next phase of my life is to take what I've learned and try and make art or make sculptural forms out of it and not, you know, not be so historically correct. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it's time to move on into something else. So, uh, so, but I do struggle with that, trying to like, you're looking at a piece of artwork or sculpture and trying to decide, you know, is it this or is it that? How should it be executed, you know? Should it be as historic, you know, how historically accurate do I want to be? What am I really looking at? You know, so yeah, it is a struggle. Um, so this is sort of a tailoring question. You showed us all those patterns and everything, and I have to wonder, how much give is there in armor? I mean, we've all probably had suits let out, but I'm trying to figure out what you do with <laughs> armor after Thanksgiving. If you fit on it on Wednesday, Monday, it's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have to skip that joust. Yeah, you're, uh, you're absolutely right there. Um, 
Yes, it's, the metal is not going to give, and uh, sometimes you have to squeeze into it, and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, that'll, that'll keep you on your diet, like if you know you're going to, uh, not going to fit into your armor. Uh, yeah, so the plates don't give, but, but there are, the way things are designed, like sometimes a, a breastplate and a back plate, you know, there's uh, different positions that, like if it just goes together front and back, you know, it, it might be allowed to be a little bit more forward or a little bit more back. Uh, you know, you might have an inch or two that it could be adjusted, right? That's not every armor, but I think most armors have the ability to do that. Uh, the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, in the, in the arms, you know, it might be too tight or too long, and that, that really happens when it's made. So, and a lot of suits, armor, you know, armor is tailor-made to people, but uh, even nowadays, and even in the Middle Ages, uh, there, were, there were people that couldn't afford to have armor tailor-made. They bought what would be called off-the-peg or off-the-rack <laughs> armor. And, uh, you know, they just had to deal with that. So, but in the past, I think there was much more people making properly fitted, made armor than there, than there is now. You know, now it's really, I don't know. I think the vast majority of people that are doing this now are not really up to the same skill level of outfitting people really well. Who, who do you think made the best armor? Who do I think made the no, best? No, I mean like at the time. Was at it the, out of Dresden? Was it out of, uh, you know, it, was it the uh, Maximilian? Was it the... You, you know, know, I haven't really, uh, haven't really thought about that. I, I would say, uh, oh, who is that? I've been um, I'm trying to think who, who the armor was. Uh, it's, there's, there's, there's a certain German armorer that has done a lot of armor. I, I can't remember his name, though, uh, off the top of my head. Uh, and there's a, there's a bunch of his pieces that are remaining. It's a German armor, but he's very intricate and very, uh, you know, they're, they're very well made. And I, I would say that he's probably one of, one of the best historical armors. Last question. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Somebody probably knows the answer. Yes, that rings a bell, but I, I don't, I'm not thinking of him. I'm thinking of somebody else. That's it. Thank you, Sean. Helmschmied, that's the person that I'm thinking of. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, do you get a sense of how much uh, information or knowledge has been lost between the medieval period and now, and how much do you feel like you might be doing like some catch-up work or make-up work or contributing to like a new pool of knowledge? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, because this armoring was completely, it was a craft that just kind of ended and not a, nobody was really practicing it with any, you know, there's a few people here and there that might know things, but pretty much it was all lost and had to be rediscovered by people in the late 20th century and into, the, into this century. So, uh, so yeah, I do feel like it's a lot of rediscovery. Uh, you know, there's not a need for modern armor, but where I do see that this knowledge could be very useful is, you know, maybe in designing spacesuits or, uh, you know, um, uh, stuff for disabled people, you know, where they have lost limbs or whatever, and, and, and somebody has to really understand the body and the mechanics and how it works. Uh, and then maybe also, you know, there, there's the possibility for military suits of armor uh, that could protect people from certain things now that we have more advanced materials, right? So, uh, but yeah, definitely I do feel like it's, it's been lost. Uh, and, uh, and I do feel that. And I do want to kind of like, I don't know, give, you know, give back what I can. Or, you know, don't let it, don't let it get lost again. I don't know, people are smart. People will rediscover things. <laughs> okay. 
Jeff. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. Jeff, that was absolutely fantastic. I'm going to move over here, if I may. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and it was just, it, it was extraordinary to see your work. It is works of art. And basically, you fulfilled everything we want the artists and lectures to do. You shared your knowledge. You have revived a trade. And your, the, your concluding remarks about how that trade can be used in the 21st century, it was absolutely inspirational. So I want to thank you, Jeff Wasson, so much. And uh, we would like, as we normally do, to make a presentation. And to do so is Victoria Dengel, our executive director. And I joined, Karen put it all beautifully, and, and she, I, very similar thought, thoughts as I sat here. But I also sat here, well, first of all, your lecture was was it was truly wonderful and i was thinking about our artisans and i was thinking how the artisan lecture series was was founded by a master ornamental metal worker jean huillard uh, and who uh, and many of you may may know jean who did the restoration of the torch and flame of the statue of liberty and so many projects that surround us in new york and that would lead to jamie swan who lectured here, as you know, two years ago, and Jamie Swan uh, is that, besides doing bicycle frame making, he also is the head machinist at the Webb Institute. And the Webb Institute was founded by a General Society member, William Webb, and it's a famous school of na naval architecture. And now here we stand with you, who was brought to us, and we are so grateful for that, that you are now part of the artisan family that uh, has come here. So uh, this is the beginning of a long relationship, and we are very grateful to you, so thank you. So on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785 by those 22 artisans, um, we express our gratitude to Jeff Wasson, Wasson Artistry, Metalwork Artisan and Artist, for medieval armor and metalwork for his participation in the General Society Artists and Lecture Series. So thank you. What an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And as many of you know, because we always like to make sure that you will come back, we've made you a lifetime member. <laughs> In, our, in the library, so thank you, and that's for you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And finally, a little memento from this evening. Thank you. Yeah.